I will welcome our speaker for the month, uh, creator Paul, Paul, I hope I'm getting it right with Guinan, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Paul Guinan. And anyway, give it away, Paul, and welcome. Hello. Well, as Bill said, uh, my name is Paul Guinan, and um, I've not actually calculated how many years I've been in the business, but at least 30 some plus. I began um, my career at, as a staff artist at First Comics in Chicago. Uh, working on titles like uh, Grimjack, American Flag, Sable, Badger, things like that, and Nexus, uh, which Anina wound up um, editing. Um, she's with us here in the meeting tonight, so if I say anything incorrect, I'm counting on her to jump in and fix it. Um, so uh, I began as a staff artist, and then my first um, professional gig was inking Tom Sutton's run on Grimjack. And after that, uh, I decided to strike out on my own to do my own stuff, uh, or, or at least, you know, not necessarily create your own, but, you know, to go and work as a freelancer in comics. And one of the first things I created was a series called Cargonauts, which is essentially Firefly. I like to make this comparison because it's, it's pr pretty close. I mean, the, the premise of Firefly was the premise of Cargonauts. And that was a, that ran briefly. But apparently it had a, an impact or an influence. Uh, and then I uh, started working uh, for Dark Horse Comics. And Anina and I created a series uh, for them called Heartbreakers, which was one of the very first uh, female action uh, titles. Uh, this is back in late 80s. And uh, Heartbreakers, uh, I will let you look up Anina's talk because she goes into great detail about uh, heartbreakers it was a, a, this team of clones that fight for uh clone rights it was a metaphor for for you know things like um uh class and and slavery and things like that we always try and sneak in politics to any one of our our um, projects i think it's really important um so then after that uh i was i i checked off a bucket list i grew up in dc comics and I was given this opportunity by um, uh, by um, uh, Archie Goodwin, who was uh, a legendary editor, uh, passed away uh, during Kronos, during the run that I was working on. And his passing actually um, kind of tanked that series because he was the driving force. And he was, I just can't rave enough about him, but I'm going to be real quick here. He allowed me and the, uh, the writer, John Francis Moore, to um, work in a truly collaborative way. Usually when you, when you talk about, oh, this comic or this character was created by these two people, really what they're talking about is uh, the writer created it and the comic book artist was given the privilege to design the costume or things like that. Um, in my case, uh, Goodwin um, uh, allowed me to truly create half the character. And because I've always had a fascination with um, three things, science fiction, history, and Mexican culture. So I, uh, this was a fantastic title for me because it, Kronos was a time traveler. And my part of his creation was that he was uh, a Mexica, which is uh, the, the proper term for Aztec. And that he had one of these stories where he was born in Tenochtitlan in like 15, 16 or 19 or something like that. And he was taken out of his timeline. And, uh, and then he winds up in the present day. Um, so here, actually, let me just start throwing up some, some stuff. So here's the, here's the first issue of my DC uh, character, Kronos. And you can see he's got the uh, Aztec, um, Aztec, little Aztec design on his outfit. And uh, I, this was the first time that I got to um, sort of exercise my interest in Aztec culture. And here's, here's one of my favorite covers from the series, which is the, uh, the what's called the Aztec sunstone, um, or, or they say calendar stone because it has calendrical glyphs on it, but it's not a calendar. It's a, it's a sunstone uh, representing the, the, the sun god and the five eras of the life cycle of the Aztecs, uh, the Aztec uh, culture. And, um, so I was having a great time working on that, but as I said, Archie Goodwin passed away, and um, the title just wasn't the same after that. The writer left to do um, to write episodes of The Flash back in 1990, and with Howard Chaykin, they like uh, those are actually the best episodes of that TV series, the ones written by Francis Moore and Chaykin. And then, and then I, I realized, well, you know, I, that's I kind of 
as a DC kid, creating a character for the DC universe, I mean, where do you go from up? So I decided to strike out doing more creator own uh, stuff rather than work for hire. And at a certain point, I even wanted to try and do different narrative, different visual narratives than traditional comic book panels. And um, I, I had this character I conceived called Boilerplate, this robot character. And it was originally going to be a graphic novel, but about 20 pages in, I realized, no, this is not how I want to tell this story. I want to tell it in a more realistic way, as if this robot really existed in history. And I, uh, one of the things that made me a history buff, aside from my dad's interest, was uh, growing up on those Time Life illustrated history volumes. I just love those things. So I decided to emulate that format. And so Anina and I teamed up to produce uh, this book, Boilerplate, um, which is essentially like one of those time life histories. It's filled with, um, it's just filled with uh, images and text um, telling the story. And the premise is, is that this, this robot actually existed and uh, he had these adventures. But again, being a big history buff, I didn't want to change history. I didn't want to do an alternate reality. Um, so everything in the book is authentic history. It just so happens that Boilerplate was there at the time. And even when we give the robot some agency uh, and interferes with history, the result still turns out the same. And uh, so Anina would, would write these wonderful um, pieces of text that were supposedly from some people's journals and whatnot. And she was, she was doing to text what I was doing with the images, where you take a pre-existing thing, in my case, a photograph, and then you I would Photoshop boilerplate into it. I had to build a, a model to do it properly. And again, in Anina's talk, uh, she has uh, photos of, of the process of me building these things. So, uh, so what you're watching here is this meeting is a, a companion piece to Anina's, to Anina's piece. And so, um, so for instance, like one example about, about how boilerplate interferes to some degree is there's, a, there's a, uh, an adventure where he meets up with Pancho Villa in real life, Pancho Villa was uh, involved in the skirmish in which he was hit in the leg with a bullet and taken into the mountains to recover. And in our story, um, it's a machine gun and boilerplate steps in front and takes most of the bullets, except one gets through, hits him in the leg and he's taken into the mountains. So, so the result is, is always the same. And, and, that, and that, that Pancho Villa story uh, also reflects again, my continuing in interest in Mexican history and culture, period. So, um, so, we, so that was successful enough that we did a follow-up book, Frank Reed, and this takes, the, the premise of this is similar to Boilerplate. What if this fictional character was involved in real history? But in this case, Frank Reed was a, an actual dime novel series from the 19th century that we adapted. And so the, the premise here is what if this dime novel character had been real and this is his biography. And so, uh, so that was a lot of fun. Again, I keep going back to this, but in Anina's talk, she, she references about how I, I traveled out to uh, Long Island, New York, to scan the collection of uh, this guy's Joe Raynon's uh, periodical collection. So all of these images are scanned from the original source material, and then I punched them up a little bit in Photoshop to make sure that the paper was white and everything was clean and crisp. And, uh, and in this, we also, we get very political with it. So um, the Frank Reed book. So we, we pushed it even further than we did with uh, Boilerplate. So, uh, so one of the, one of the one of the sections in Frank Reed that I particularly enjoy is where Frank Reed is involved in the Banana Wars, which was a series of military in interventions uh, that really ramped up in between World War I and World War II, where we were constantly going in there at uh, the behest of like the United Fruit Company would have its, you know, have, have, its, have its country get up in arms because they controlled the government and they, and, you know, and they, and they paid shit wages. So, so, the, so then the United Fruit Company would contact the State Department State Department would send in Marines because that's always considered a temporary force as opposed to army. They would put down the rebellion and then move on. So, so, we, uh, so, so, so we went to town with the, Frank Reed, uh, with the Frank Reed book and the politics in it. And uh, after that, um, you know, I, just, I, I was kind of um, floundering a little bit as to you know, what, I should, what I should do next. And uh, the running thread that you see in Kronos and Boilerplate and Frank Reed, the idea of sci-fi combined with some time travel, combined with uh, Mexican subject, um, 
on enough finally convinced me to to take on this story that I've been wanting to do forever. I mean, going all the way back, as you can see, to the Kronos series in the 90s, which is tell the story of the Aztec Empire and how the arrival of conquistadors led to its fall just in, in just a couple of years, just a few years uh, after the arrival of these Spaniards. I was fascinated by this story because it's, first of all, it's unique in human history. There is literally nothing like it. It is as close as this planet will get to an alien first contact epic. Because as everybody here knows, one side of the planet, Europe, Asia, Africa, all knew about each other and benefited from knowing each other. Like China gave, gave most of Europe's technology to them. So, uh, so they, they all had this thing going on. But in the Americas, they were completely isolated from the rest of the world. So as far as the people in the Americas are concerned, especially the civilizations that came up like the Maya and the Aztecs, for them, that was it. That was the whole world. To the north, there was desert. To the south, there was jungle. Um, it wasn't really worth them exploring because they had everything they needed. They had a good setup where they were in central Mexico. So, uh, so, so for me, the story came off as, as like a real life science fiction story. And um, as I started to really research it in depth, I, I discovered that it was filled with myth. I mean, just, oh, I mean, I never really experienced a, a, a specific subject like that being just so misrepresented. I mean, to begin with, the idea that Cortez and his men were considered to be white gods returning as part of some prophecy that was, a, that was going on about Quetzalcoatl coming back, that was all nonsense. Um, Cortez had this teenage girl translator that made everything possible. The idea that the fall of the Aztec Empire, the linchpin for that, rests on a 16-year-old native girl is an amazing dramatic, uh, is, is an amazing drama. And uh, of course, it's mythologized that she fell in love with Cortez and that they were romantic lovers, which is total bullshit. Um, so I just kept finding all of this stuff that was wrong that I had I bought into. You know, I believed some of this stuff. So I realized that that the story, because of its because of how fantastic it is, even when told accurately, and 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 because you know I was trying to do myth busting, I decided on making this series as nonfiction as is possible when doing something like this. I mean, obviously you have to dramatize scenes between people and you know their dialogue, what they're saying with each other. So that that you have to sort of make up. But uh, but there's a lot of material out there that um, that I was able to bring to bear and and to show off the, how oh anyway to to demonstrate the the series uh, authenticity accuracy I uh, make sure that for every 10 page episode, because it's currently a web comic, at some point it will be printed into volumes, but uh, for the time being, for every 10 pages, uh, 10 page episode in this web comic, there's at least five pages of illustrated endnotes to, to make sure that you, know, that you know that everything that you're reading did in fact happen. Again, as best as we can determine from the surviving materials. So I obviously, you know, uh, um, try and have an awareness about the bias of the materials I'm looking at, my own personal biases, and try and navigate that as 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 best as best as possible. So let me just show off. Uh, so here's um here's uh the sort of the the cover image, so to speak, the uh, of the series, and this is based on a very famous painting that's in Mexico uh, by this famous muralist. Um, uh, and we're sort of homaging it, and, and we make sure we that to you know to credit him at the bottom. So, Anna mentions in her talk, and that we had this um, long discussions about two key aspects of comic books, regardless of what, what it's what what the text or the images are, and that is, is um, format. Most comics are portrait, so I went with, um, but I wanted to go with landscape because I grew up on uh, Cinerama and Cinemascope and. Toho scope and all of that. I just love vistas, and this 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 the, this material really lends itself to vistas. Everything is like the city and the armies and the landscapes. So here's like a, a representative example of um, of like one of the panels that shows off just how much uh, one has to sort of research for this. So you have not only not only do I have to look up the outfits, oh uh, uh, what 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 
people wore, but also everything, all the iconography, not just murals, but just the icons that you will find in uh, in Aztec culture um, has to be researched because uh, I'm sure everybody here has, has seen examples of like, um, some teenager in Japan wearing an English t-shirt that makes, the text makes no sense whatsoever. So I guess I've always been haunted by that. So I have to make sure that every, all the symbols used are, are correct. And so even more so than the elaborate drawing itself, the research is amazingly time consuming. So uh, so here's another, here's, here's one of my favorite panels, which is of course it would be, which is a, a studio, an art studio. So here's, um, Here's a, a, an art studio in the Aztec Empire. And uh, you can see that, that the setup is not too far away from the kinds of things that we see in certain Asian cultures. You know, uh, no, no chairs, low slung tables, lots of mats. Um, and again, the, the, the murals, like uh, they all represent something or another. So, so for instance, um, the um, figure uh, on here is the deity, patron deity for artists and creative types. So I, I try and tie that in. And again, I mentioned that in the, in the end notes. So uh, here's, another, here's another favorite. This is a, a governor's mansion and he's entertaining somebody. So, so in, in just doing a scene like this, I have to not only look up, you know, like in what their, what their cloaks were, like the, like the wall in the background, the, that mural. Um, some of these murals, um, because there's very little Aztec mural work left, the city of Tenochtitlan uh, was totally destroyed and Mexico City was built on top of it. So um, there's not a lot left. Uh, so as a result, I sometimes have to use proxies. So for instance, the mural in the background comes from Teotihuacan. But Teotihuacan was a huge influence in, in Mexica culture, the way that the Greeks influenced the Romans. So uh, it's, you know, I, again, I have Mexican consultants on this. So they, uh, they you know, signed off on that idea. They thought it was a, a very good way to, um, to at least get in, you know, that kind of, um, that kind of uh, uh, subject. So uh, aside from that, I also have to work out just things that you might take for granted the flowers, the plants. I mean, I have to look up Mexican plants and ones that were native 500 years ago because there's been a lot of imports. Um, like for instance, their board game, uh, Patoli, you know, like uh, research that, how is that played? You know, I, I wanna make sure that the pieces are on the right part of the board. So, so, it's, a, so it's, a, it's an insane amount of world building, but one of the fun things about doing historical, uh, historical set pieces is that the world building, all the pieces of the world building are all there. So it's, so it, 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 of course you have to research it, but, but once you go in there, any given culture, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll find, you know, what kind of cups they had, you know, what kind of, you know, outfits they wore. So I don't have to necessarily make up anything. I just have to um, choose among, among what is, what exists, what exists in this, uh, what is, what exists, what's left. And oh, uh, and speaking of Mexican consultants, for two years before I even put pen to paper, I mean, I've been doing some writing, but for a couple of years there, I just did the outreach uh, uh, for, uh, for Mexican consultants and, and teachers, academics. And surprisingly, it's, uh, you know, it's called a hell site, but Twitter was instrumental in, 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 in hooking me up with all of this fantastic talent. Um, so so I've, I have the great, privilege and honor to have um, support from not just uh, Mexican artists and authors um, and academics, but also activists, well, you know, like uh, some hardcore indigenous activists who would normally not want, you know, somebody who's outside of their culture telling their story. But once, once I showed them the homework, once I showed them the homework uh, and, and showed them the context of the story I was telling about how I was respectful, and uh, they they all signed on, and and it's and I've gotten a fantastic reaction from people in Mexico because this story has never been told properly in in a visual medium. There are some great prose histories out there, plenty of those, but a couple of years back, uh, somebody tried to do a TV series about this. It was shut down um, not too after its first season by COVID, so there won't be any further seasons. But it was emphasizing Cortez. It was from their Spanish perspective. 
And there was very little uh, about the Aztec side of the story. And when they did show it, they showed it as this really drab, grungy, just <laughs> what certain politicians would call a shithole. You know, it's just like they just their depiction of it was just tremendously disrespectful. They made them they made them look like savages. Mm -hmm. And uh, so so there so there's nothing really out there. And as a result, um, the audience for this is starved for this kind of material. And and so I so I'm just I'm just I'm just I'm just happy that I'm I'm getting it right enough that I'm not hounded out hound, hounded out of existence. So here's um here's a, just a couple more pages from this. So, so here's a sequence where a uh, a guy is a messenger uh, is is has talked to the Spaniards, realized that they're they're a bunch of jerks, and needs to get back to Tenochtitlan to. Uh, to talk to the leaders there and tell them, look, we, we've got to do something about these guys. And so, so it takes several days to go from the coast where the Spaniards are set up in our, in our story at this point to Tenochtitlan. So he, uh, he's, he, he gets in his little car there and he goes, he goes, uh, he goes uh, for days, as you can see from the progression from night to day, he goes to days and he winds up in Tenochtitlan. And uh, this, this was kind of fun because I had, um, I had this idea of, um, of like the temptations that he would he would be experiencing. So uh, so in the second panel, he he's going by a, a brothel. Uh, uh, this is the these are these are our prostitutes. And then the mural is the patron saint of sex and vice and <laughs> prostitutes. And um, that that came out of the idea of um, the Odyssey. Where Odysseus, you know, goes by the islands and the sirens try and tempt him, but no, he must continue. He must go on. Um, so that's so. There's that's what I'm working on. This is the is that's kind of my obsession. I've been I've been uh, it's it's been slow, but uh, but I'm committed to this for at least you know however long it takes. Which I'm at this point I'm calculating to be at least another half dozen years. So thank you for your patience. So here's a so I'm going to break down uh, the process for for how I how I how I do these um, pages. One second here. What the heck? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm getting a message. Okay, so I was just about to go on about that. So, uh, so here's the here's here's how this works. I have uh, uh, working with me on this series, uh, David Hahn, who has done has been in the business also for 20 some years. We co-founded Helioscope Studios uh, here in downtown Portland, along with people like Steve Lieber and Ron Randall and others. And uh, he recently, a couple, not recently, a couple years ago, a few years ago, several years ago, he uh, moved to Montana, but we still keep in touch. And he's he's committed to this project. And I even warned him, it's gonna, we're gonna be doing this for a decade. And he says, that's cool, that's fine. He's, he's uh, one of my closest friends. So, so what happens is I will, um, I will uh, work out thumbnails or layouts. I'll do I'll, for for myself. I'll do some thumbnails and I'll do some you know some notes just just to get a to get a sense of what I want to do for the page, and then I'll do layouts. And here's here's an example of of some layouts. So here is a scene that's going to be set in Montezuma's palace. So the top panel is is a master shot of the palace. And then he, this takes place at night. So he's sleeping and he's been given orders. He's given orders to his people that when these messengers show up from the coast, which I was just showing you one of these, one of these messengers, um, that he should be woken no matter what the hour is. So this, so in real life, this is really what happened. So in, uh, just after midnight, the messengers show up in Tenochtitlan line with the newest information about the Spaniards and his wives, he had several wives, um, are uh, this, this, this this is a servant. She she informs the one of the two wives that the messengers have arrived, and now it's up to them. And now it's up to them to wake up Montezuma. And you can see even here, Montezuma has a couple of concubines in his bed that have to get out now. And uh, and then and then the uh, one of his his wives comes in and trepidatiously comes over to to wake him up. And he goes, okay, I won't I won't see them here. I'll see them you know I'll see them in my office, so to speak. So uh, so once once I send this off to David, he then he then comes back with with uh, an inked an inked the inked version, so you can get a better sense of like all the figures and the, and the stuff. And he's not, as you can see, he's not doing lighting 
we're not like in this in this series because of all of the complexities of the textile patterns and the mural work and whatnot. Um, I decided to just do sort of god lighting with a little bit of shading to give some kind of volume. So there is a source light to a degree, like the general light is either coming from the left or the right or from the top. And then the rest of it is done with, uh, with color. So, so there's, the, um, there's the penciled version of the scene where, she, where Madison is woken up by, by, one, by his, his, second, his second wife. And then, and then I have, uh, <laughs> and then here's the final, uh, without lettering. I mean, I, I wanted to give you guys a chance to see this without the lettering. So you can see uh, it's colored for night and I've got some sort of lighting sources in the, in the, in the top panel where flame, you know, there's little flames going on. And this is also a, a, a nod to the fact that when Tenochtitlan went to bed, all of the, all of the merchants and, and, and especially delivery people would all like then step it up because the roads were, you know, in the, in the downtown city, the roads were a little clearer. So a lot of a lot of um, shipping, so to speak, when it went, uh, happened at night, and then uh, so you can see the uh, the wives and Montezuma in the background, and again for the uh, I in trying to you know give some kind of context for the for the background murals, what we have here are these are the deities of the night. There's four of them, and so I put them along the wall here, and then on his headboard is a representation of the eagle perched on the cactus. That was part of the founding myth of Tenochtitlan. It, it, the story goes that these wandering nomads uh, were looking for a place to settle and they came to this island and they saw this eagle perched on a cactus and that they took that as a sign and they set up Tenochtitlan there. Um, much later, in the, during the colonial era, um, a snake was added to the eagle's beak that was not part of the original Mexica myth and that symbol remains on Mexico's on Mexico's flag to this day it's the, got the tricolor the red white and uh, the green and in the middle you will see an eagle on a cactus with a snake in its mouth so uh, as I was saying the most of the most of Tenochtitlan was raised to the ground and Mexico City was built on top of it and this, what they call the downtown, the historic district of Mexico City is what the original island of Tenochtitlan used to be. And there's some interesting things. If you, if you get a chance to visit downtown Mexico City, there's this main open square called the Zocolo. Zocolo. And um, it's been like that forever. It's been that since the founding of Tenochtitlan. So you can stand in the middle of that, of that open square and you're and you're it's like time travel it's like it's been exactly that way and you look off in one direction you'll see the national palace where the president you know set up the national palace is built on the exact footprint of Moctezuma's palace so you get a sense of like the scale of things and several of the churches were built on top of temples because I mean if you're going to raise a city to the ground and rebuild it why not keep the foundations you know why not save yourself some work so every time somebody digs beneath uh, the, the cathedral, the main cathedral or the uh, national palace, they will find like a room or you know, something or another. And in, in actually in the late seventies, um, they discovered uh, a, a, this, this archeological piece that, that sat at the base of the main temple, the big one in, in, the, in the center of Tenochtitlan. And they were so excited about it because they, they now realized, oh, we can find this main temple. So they, they, it was, the political will was, must have been impressive. So they took out like a whole like square block of, of these colonial buildings and it's now an archeological site. And uh, Anin and I, uh, in 2019, for the 500th anniversary of the meeting of Cortez and Moctezuma, uh, we took a trip to Mexico and um, spent a couple of weeks there, took a bazillion photos, visited all these archeological sites. And one of the only one of the only archaeological sites uh, uh, for the Mexica that, ex that that has been excavated and is on public display is is the main temple. But next to it, which is now you know just sort of shaved down, you can see sort of the layers about how they built it up, and you can see recreations. But next to the main temple is this thing called the House of Eagles, which was the military headquarters for the Aztec generals. 
And so I, I set a sequence uh, just, and I just recently posted, in fact, I posted the final page today. Uh, we, the last page, the, just the very last page I'm working on takes place at the House of Eagles. And I was just super thrilled because Anand and I walked, walked on, those, on those grounds. And so, so here's the layouts for my sequence that takes place at the House of Eagles. You can see uh, the top is, is the building itself. Again, recreated from the archaeological record. And there's models of this in the um, National Museum in Mexico City. And then, uh, and then below them, uh, I mean, the next panel is, uh, is uh, these Aztec generals. And then flanking them are these very famous eagle statues. You may have seen them uh, in, when you look up stuff about Aztec sculpture. And so they're, they're, so this space is very, it's a very famous space. It con contains a lot of like a lot of the major pieces, if you'll ever go see an Aztec show, come from this one location because, because they, uh, they I mean, they, they were just blown away that they, that they even discovered it, let alone that there was so much stuff left there when they covered it over, when the Spaniards just covered it over. So, um, so for this, I had to be especially careful about all of the uh, research on it. So here's David's, Here's David's uh, uh, inked first. And you can see again that uh, everything is left open for to, you know, so that we can fill in the uh, fill in all of the murals and textile patterns. In particular, uh, there was these benches um, that had that were that had this carved procession of warriors. And, and that was a real challenge because uh, I had to go and look up archaeological records from the from the National Museum, the Institute of, it's called the INA, the A-N-A-H, the, you know, the National Museum of Archaeology and History in Mexico City. So, so I, I, uh, I, here's a, here's a, so this is, these are from, this is from the end notes. So you get a sense of what the end notes look like. So here's the end notes describing the House of Eagles, and you can see the bench designs uh, and how they how they fit with the thing. You can see here's a shot of me talking with the uh, talking with the archaeologist on site, and Anna, of course, took the picture photos of this. And so, uh, and then here are the um, here are those eagle statues. I, here, here's the location of where the House of Eagles stood relative to the main temple, and then here are the uh, the eagle statues themselves. Again, standing on those, you can see them barely standing on the benches, and here's. Here's, an, here's the, and some archaeological records that show where everything is, you know, where the eagle statues stood, where the benches are, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so as a result, that allows me to produce this insanely detailed um, piece here. So you can see the, uh, you can see uh, the, the, mural, the mural stuff, and you can see the insanity that is the benches. Let me get in close on that. Like you can see the the procession, the procession of uh, of uh, warriors on these on these benches, which is I just it's just super cool. So uh, that is a little sort of preview of or a little taste of my how obsessive and insane this project is. <laughs> I know we got about fifteen minutes uh, left here in this session, so. I'm going to open it up to some Q and A if you don't if you don't mind. If Not anybody has any we'll any uh, any what's that? Oh, someone else. The first one that occurred to me was looking at those finished pages. Uh, the accuracy aside, how do you go about designing your palettes? It's uh, oh, well, that's you know that's kind of it's almost improvisational in a way because what I do is I lay down. The important, yeah, yeah. So, so I lay down these. I lay down what needs to be there, the, which colors I can't change, mm -hmm. and then, and then from there, I, 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 so I use that as to where I go off from. Like for instance, and and I and I do have to take some artistic license. So for instance, this wall here, I this is accurate. The blue step pattern and the little rainbow stripe thing that is correct to that wall. But the wall itself would have been red the way that those benches are. And that was just too much, that's just too much red going on. It's just too busy. So, so, so that's my artistic license where I, I remove 
I remove the red from there so that it reads better. Similar with the building itself, the building probably would have been more colorful, but at a certain point, you got to let the eye rest. So, Donna, you you had a question? Just real quick, um, in researching for the colors, did you take advantage of seeing what colors were available locally from the natural native plants? Oh, they have, yes, they, they, they have, um, there's people that are really into that. And, and, and there's actually a guy on Twitter who is, his account is nothing but recreating uh, it's these tilmas, these cloaks that were worn by these people. And so he uses all the original uh, approaches. So he, he will go out to this one particular river and find these one particular, this one particular kind of snail that produces a purple dye. He'll go to this one other place. There are these plants that produce um, this red dye. Co co uh, no, in actually, insects. These little cochino, cochino. Mm -hmm. These little tiny red insects mm -hmm. that are used to the present day to dye things like uh, dull uh, red, red um, uh, juice or um, or uh, lipstick. I mean that 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 bug that bug extract is used to, to the present day. Well, so, actually, so we, before before we discovered uh, we discovered haha we didn't discover um, before the old world ran into the new world uh, they did not have that brilliant perfect red uh, they had more of an orange red it was only when they found the insect color mm -hmm. that they got that gorgeous brilliant red that's right the, which the as I recall the um, feathers and these insects etc that was their actual money gold was more decorative. That's that is correct. Their 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 day to day currency were uh, uh, caco beans, and uh, and then they would also have for for larger sums they would have certain inches length of uh, like quills that would have gold dust in them. So like a one inch quill, a two inch quill with some gold dust, and then the and then but the but the main the main cur currency was um, textiles, it was cloaks. You know, I'll pay you five cloaks for this or whatever. Yeah, yeah. They, 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 that's the other thing about this culture is, is that it is. I mean, it is far more sophisticated than I even realized when I started doing the research. Um, it's they had everything. They had everything. They had hospitals. They had libraries. They had a, this law complex with multiple jurisdictions. They had you know like a you know like whatever criminal courts and, and 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 commerce courts and a supreme court. So I mean, they had all of this stuff, and it was just. It's just it's just mind blowing. The more the more I read about it, the more impressed I am. And then, of course, you know, the elephant in the room, the whole thing that everybody likes to just bust them on is the what, they, what people call the human sacrifice. But even that, like according to Cortez's own letters, about 3000 people were sent to altars across the empire in a year. And in Tenochtitlan, they've they uncovered this skull rack, a ceremonial skull rack, and it was added to at the rate of 100, 200 pe people per year. And then most of the people that were sent to altars were prisoners of war. There were warriors who, you know, like, and this is, you know, this depends on like what words you want to use, indoctrinated, brainwashed, or whatever in their culture to believe that uh, dying on the battlefield and dying on the altar were of equal honor, because you're still going to the same afterlife, you know, you're still going to be celebrated as this warrior. So in a weird way, a lot of those, a lot of those altar deaths were, were casualties you know combat casualties and then were and they then, also were they also it was a higher honor because of course the shed blood on an altar will keep the sun rolling across the sky that would be a greater honor yeah probably and then and then there was also a capital punishment so like some people sent to the altar were guilty of crimes and but i mean that was a different kind of death you know they would you know, the whole religious routine around it would be a different context than a warrior mm -hmm. And then yes, uh, two or three times a year, a child was selected for, uh, uh, for the rain god, Tlaloc. And even in those cases, it, there was recent, recently, um, this, this friend of mine, scientist in Mexico is doing bone isotope analysis. Uh, and I was asked to provide recreations. I drew, I drew illustrations of the three people that, that she was doing bone ice uh, analysis with. And it turns out that the, 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 the bones of the children revealed that they had incurable chronic illnesses. So even in that case, like the, the culture is trying to mitigate their religious demands, you know? So it's, so it's, it's a much more complex culture than, than is stereotyped in, in popular media. So. 
Thank you. Sure. Absolutely. I was going to say gracias, but how do you say thank you <laughs> in the relevant language? <laughs> it's it's a long word. Plow, uh, see, this is one of the, see, I have, I have problems enough pronouncing words I've grown up with all my life. I have, I have some dyslexia and, uh, and so, so it's, it's been, it's, I've got, I've got the, the, all the core stuff down, you know, I know how to pronounce, you know, Huitzapochtli and Tezcatlipoca, Moctezuma and things like that. But <laughs> the, some, some of the vocabulary, it's the language is called Nahuatl. It's spelled with an L on the end, but every time you see any Aztec word or, you know, English transliteration really of, 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 a, of an Aztec word and it ends with a, that TL, uh -huh. Like Quetzalcoatl, it's not ol, it's Quetzalcoatl. Uh -huh. so, I and then I, that's another thing they only learned recently, you know, doing the deep dive. So it's uh, it's, uh so everybody can become an expert in a subject if you study it hard for multiple years. <laughs> well, I was going to ask you if you could um, somehow list, you know, um, some good history books that we could read oh, about sure. this, and then also my. Um, son and his girlfriend who have graduated with their linguistics degrees are very interested in things like what you're talking about, how the sounds are made and things like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. So if you have some books about that, that would be great for them. Absolutely. I have, I have uh, on our side, I have a bibliography um, and the, and the books, I mean, the bibliography goes all the way back to, you know, letters of conquistador in the 1500s, but the last half dozen or so entries, like I do it in chronological order. So the last half dozen or so books are the ones that uh, are the ones I would highly recommend. I can I can I can give you a couple right off the top of my head. There's this one book called The Fifth Son by Camilla Townsend, which is the current gold standard. I mean, this is um, she wrote this book using uh, indigenous materials rather than traditional histories that have been published in the past where they just use Spanish accounts. So, uh, so fifth son, highly recommended. Okay. And then, and then you were speaking of specifically the language. Also, in just the last couple of years, this guy named Gordon Whitaker uh, came out with this book called um, uh, "What is it? It's called it's I forget the title. It's deciphering deciphering the 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 Nahuatl language because um, it turns out that. And again, another another misunderstanding about the culture. It turns out that the Aztecs did not just have a hieroglyphic language, but that they had glyphs that were syllables and you know specific sounds. So they had they had something that was in between, you know, our, our what we think of as as you know alphabet and and hieroglyphics. They had they were on their way to producing, you know, an actual alphabet. So 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 it isn't just about so yeah, it's, it's language is, I mean, the written language is a lot more sophisticated than was previously thought. Perfect, my son will love that. Sure, and, 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 the, and the Whitaker book is uh, heavily illustrated. So you know, it shows, you know, how like this means this, and then when you combine these two things, then it means that, uh, so, yep. Great, thank you. Sure, sure. I remember recently somebody was talking about those, those, um, those uh, it's almost like a Fisher Price kind of thing, where these dogs like will hit buttons that say words, and you can and and somebody somebody combined water and bone to, and the dog was really referring to an ice cube. <laughs> so 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 like you know these kinds of combinations can you know are, are fascinating. Any other questions? We're getting close. We got about five minutes or more. Anybody? Mm -hmm. I can say that um, yeah, you can go to our website, bigredhair.com. It's it's uh, the the series is free. Uh, I would ask uh, people consider um, supporting us on Patreon, and uh, you know for a, just a buck a month, it's twelve bucks a year. And that can't be bad. Um, the the I have other tiers, but pretty I pretty much post everything on the buck tier. The upper tiers are for like. Um, you know, if, if you invest, you'll get like sketch cards or page original arts. And for the for the for the really big donors, they get their likeness drawn in as a as a character in the series. Um, but uh, but yeah, you can read you can read it for free on, on Big Red Hair. Can you slowly say how it's um, what the website is? I couldn't get it. Oh, I'm sorry. Bigredhair.com. Thank you. Mm hmm. And I put a link in the chat to Paul's um, bibliography, and I'll throw the main Aztec Empire page in Thank there you. also. 
And uh, as, as plans for the future, um, our hope uh, is to um, get a printed volume out, hopefully in, in the next in this next year at maybe probably at the end of the year um but uh the the deal is is that we have i'm two pages away from finishing up episode eight so you can read everything up to episode eight minus the last couple pages and then when we get to episode 10 that will be the first story arc and this is where cortez makes his first um his first alliance with the coastal uh group called the Teutonic before he marches inland and so, uh, so that 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 uh, once we complete the ten episodes, that will then become the first printed of three or four volumes. Um, and again, over the next six eight years, <laughs> who knows how long this is going to take? <laughs> yeah, because it's interesting. I was remember reading where they say empire, but it sort of came off like confederacy is probably a more accurate description, which, which. Uh, to a certain extent, could, uh, the Spaniards were able to uh, exploit some of the instabilities of that. Yes, right. Well, the the, the empire wasn't. It wasn't. I mean, first of all, the, the whole thing is a misnomer because because first of all, they weren't called the Aztecs. Right. Uh, that's a later invention. There were there were there were a triple alliance of Mexica, uh, of uh, Tlacopan, and Texcoco. So it's three city states, and the triple alliance, and that's that's what that's what I use uh, colloquially. Uh, when I say Aztec Empire, I'm re referring to the polity, not the people. And uh, so they ran a, a hegemony, hegemony, hegemonic empire. So they they didn't really have they didn't they wouldn't send out people and like take over their land physically or set up a, a, a government or have a standing army um, or, or ask them to change their religion or language. It was like a mob boss extortion racket. Basically, it was like, you get to run your thing. We'll leave you alone. You pay us once a year this sum, which for you know a lot of these city states was quite a burden. It was a little intense. You pay us this, and then we'll leave you alone. But if you, you, know, if you cross us, then we're going to come in and, you know. Basically, just, they no. were the Roman Empire. Uh, right, yeah. <laughs> and actually, I'm glad you said mob boss, because that's kind of how I... Uh, pursued it but i know exactly how little i know and i didn't want to throw out the, that word that that assumption right. no 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 that's 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 a, that's even even like there's this one archaeologist uh, on twitter michael smith he's he uses that phrase to describe it all the time and and and, and the analogy works i mean like like in in, in a real in like in a, in a in a whatever new york whatever little italy scenario you would have the corner store that would be mob controlled but the mob wouldn't be going in there like ordering the stuff for the store or anything. They wouldn't be running the day-to-day -day business. They would just say, you know, just pay us. And, and, and if they didn't, then they would torch the store, but the store would have insurance because the, the point is, is that you want to punish them severely even, but you don't want to completely put them out of business because then you're, you're destroying your revenue income. You know, you're just like, you teach them a lesson and then they're going to, you know, get back to, you know, paying you. And 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 the and the, also the other thing about the uh, the Aztec Empire it wasn't as I mean certainly it was it was very martial it was, you know, a lot of it was centered around war but but the thing is is that they didn't have a standing army they used it was a you know, the the peasant soldier thing where they would have people you know who worked the farms join up for a campaign and as a result they could only do it once a year in you know in in, in a in a period of time where they didn't need to plant or harvest so uh, so as a result these 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 wars were almost ritual they were almost like this has a seasonal thing and then and then the deal is is that if you capture a couple people during a during a combat you get like a captaincy like an officership if you can't like the upper limit was seven once you get to seven you're like a general so that also suggests the scale of it i mean you know like it, it just it, it wasn't this kind of thing because everybody has this European perception of empire. Send tens of thousands of troops, you know, across the borders and you know, and totally destroy their lands. And and that wasn't the case here. It was a much more managed, ritualized uh, thing that was on a scale that that is much smaller than what what people think of. I mean, if in the Aztec Empire itself is only is only not only just the central Mexico. I mean, some of the, some, its influence maybe went from coast to coast. But it was mainly just 
just this one little area. I mean, Tenochtitlan only had about 150,000 people and the empire that they controlled was only you know, a few million. I mean, they controlled an area that was about 10 million, but I mean, the actual day-to-day, -day, the actual people that would call themselves part of the empire. So it was the, the scale of it is a lot smaller than what people would think because, because they think of like Eurasian things. They think of Genghis Khan or Alexander, like these sprawling kinds of uh, things. And that wasn't the case. Well, in the New World, it was the main tradition all over the New World was more like ceremonial war. Right. Because yeah, they, they really couldn't wars. afford to wipe out populations and grain crops and animals. They yeah. they had to survive. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It was, it was like sustainable combat. <laughs> I, 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 I'm afraid I've, I've spent as much time, if not more, talking about the Aztecs than my actual Aztec comic. <laughs> but I'm happy to do so. I, I, love, I love trying to, you know, like set the record straight, so to speak. Well, as the speaker coordinator, I, I want to say that I am very happy I was able to get both you and Anina on, on the show here and uh, that we you have both been an amazing um, addition to uh, what we what we do here. Thank you so much. I, I appreciate that. And and again, I said it before, I'll say it again. Please, everybody here, check out Anna's talk because she gets much more into like our career, the heartbreakers, mm -hmm. you know, thing, and, and, and you know, boilerplate and Frank Reed. And so if you're, if you're interested in that kind of stuff, please check out that talk. I, I really dug it myself. Also, she goes on about the, the, the Friends of Lulu, which I think is a super important piece of history that, uh, that needs to be uh, brought up whenever possible. So thank you, Anna.